Hey everyone, it's Tira with Rent Mason Bees, and today I wanted to do a little presentation about what a solitary bee is. Um, specifically, we're going to talk about mason and leafcutter bees. Um, I've done a presentation, I do this to different universities and master gardener groups, and I thought I would just do a recording so that we can share it with anybody who wants to learn about what a solitary bee is. Um, I've incorporated some really beautiful pictures of solitary bees and video, um, so I just thought I'd dive in and teach you about solitary mason and solitary leafcutter bees. All right, let me turn my camera off so that I can present to you all the slides. All right, so today we're going to talk about mason and leafcutter bees. Um, here at Rent Mason Bees, we work with three species of solitary bees. We work with the blue orchard mason bee, the horn-faced mason bee, and the leafcutter bee. Not a lot of people know that there are 20,000 known species of bees and 90% of them are solitary. So the bulk of our bee population, we are, they are solitary bees. And you're gonna learn what that means. So solitary bees are very vital to our food production and our ecosystem because of the way they pollinate. Um, more and more farmers are using solitary bees to help them pollinate their crops, which helps the honeybee workload. So we get a lot of questions if solitary mason bees and leafcutter bees work with honeybees. Absolutely, yes, they do. Um, farmers are using honeybees and solitary bees. Uh, solitary bees are a bit hardier than honeybees and the way they collect pollen is a lot different. I'll tell you a little bit about that in, in a couple more slides, but um, solitary bees collect pollen all over their body and um, honeybees collect meticulously, they collect that pollen in their back legs. Um, so solitary bees are remarkable pollinators. And when farmers use them, um, they actually get a greater return of yield on their crops. So let's learn a little bit about what a solitary bee is. So what does solitary mean? So solitary means that, um, that they don't have a hive to protect, they don't have a queen to protect. Each female lays all her own eggs. So solitary, she's by herself. She gathers her own food. She finds her own nesting material. Um, they don't have mandibles that chew wood, so they have to go find natural holes in their environment. So they'll go find natural reeds or woodpecker holes or your nesting blocks. Um, because they don't have a hive or a queen to protect, they are super sweet docile bees. They're not going to swarm, they're not going to attack, and the best part is they don't sting. So they are very, very sweet little bees that you can stand right next to the nesting block and watch them work. So let's talk first about mason bees. So this picture that you see here is a blue orchard mason bee. You can tell because it has that iridescent green sheen on its body. Looks a little bit like a housefly. Um, there are two types of bees that we work with, the Blue Orchard Mason Bee. That bee is native to North America. Um, it can tolerate colder climates, wetter climates, which is why farmers love to use them in their crops. Um, the other bee is the horn face mason bee. Now that bee is found um, throughout Midwest and Eastern United States, and it's better suited to um, the more warm, humid climates. So what makes these bees super pollinators? Um, they are known as one of mother nature's best pollinators because of the way they pollinate. They have tiny little hairs all over their belly called scopa, and they're kind of that clumsy, slow moving bee that flops from flower to flower. So when they land, they land pretty heavy. They belly flop onto that flower, which collects pollen all over their abdomen and body, their head, their back. And since they're not meticulously collecting it like a honeybee does to carry it back to the hive for honey, um, these solitary bees um, just flop pollen all over the other flowers, which makes them incredible pollinators and one of Mother Nature's best pollinators. 
So some pretty interesting statistics that we love to share. Um, studies show that mason bees pollinate 95% of the flowers they land on, and they can reach up to 2,000 blossoms a day. Um, and they do help those honeybees that are working so hard in our crops making food. Because of the way they pollinate, 400 mason bees do the work of 40,000 honeybees. And again, they don't sting. So this makes them remarkable little pollinators, very gentle pollinators that you can watch and observe in your yard. And then when they're out in fields and crops with farmers, they're not gonna bother anybody working out there either. So they are highly, highly efficient pollinators that improve the overall health of our ecosystem. As they're belly flopping onto those blossoms, they are going to be enriching everything they touch. So those trees are gonna go stronger, those plants are gonna grow bigger. Um, it's gonna help our overall soil system and our air, and they're just an amazing contributor to our ecosystem. We get asked a lot of times, what about those bees? I see them chewing wood, they're messing up my, my house. Those are, not, um, those are not the mason bees or the leafcutter bees. Their mandibles aren't strong enough to chew wood. Those are the carpenter bees. They're a much darker bee, bigger wings. They have a bit louder buzz if you see them. So mason bees don't chew wood. They have to use natural wood, natural holes that they find in their environment. So they might use a carpenter bee's hole that's dug, been, been built already, but she's not doing the damage. Those are the carpenter bees. Um, the mason bees use their mandibles to collect mud to construct their nesting cham chambers. Um, this little bee, as you can see, is completely covered in pollen, like we were talking about their belly flopping. They get it all over their bodies, all over that tiny scopa, the little hairs on their body. This little girl is capping off her hole with the mud that she's collected. Um, I love this little video. I grabbed this uh, last year in my, my macro lens in slow motion so that you can see her working. Um, so she's going to crawl into that hole. She's going to go into your yard. She's going to gather some mud. She's going to crawl in the back of that hole. She's going to cap it with mud. And then she's going to lay a pollen loaf. And then she's going to put a little baby. She's going to lay her little baby larva next to that pollen loaf. And then she'll cap it with some more mud. Those are called cells. So each cell will have a mud, pollen, baby, mud, mud, pollen, baby, mud. So they'll she'll make a cell for her babies. There'll be in each hole about five to seven little babies. Then those little baby larvae were going to eat that pollen loaf and they're going to grow into a big chubby larva. Um, if you check out our YouTube video, you can see some of the videos that I do of what are your baby bees doing, um, where I open up the nesting block and you can see the little tiny larva that has eaten the pollen loaf and has grown into a chubby little bee. And believe it or not, it doesn't take them very long to then spin a silk cocoon. So that little chamber will then be full of a full grown bee and a cocoon. And they will hibernate in that cocoon all winter long. Um, so here's a fun fact for you. Did you know that mason bees lay 15 eggs in their lifetime, whereas the honeybee queen, she lays 2,000 eggs a day. So mason bees need our help for their, for their whole population as well. By, by cleaning their nesting blocks, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, you're actually helping your solitary bee population because they don't have that large of a uh, life cycle and they don't lay that many eggs. So mason bees, like I said, they're only going to live about four to six weeks. So she's going to go out and pollinate. She's going to enrich her habitat. She's going to lay 15 or so babies, and then she's done. Um, her job for, in her life is done. So her little babies will continue on after her. So like I mentioned, those little um, larvae will eat the um, pollen loaf and then they'll spin a silken cocoon. You can see in that top picture there, that's a big chubby larvae. That's one that's eaten all the pollen that its mom left for it. It's about ready to spin its silk cocoon. Again, check out our video on YouTube to see the progress of how this all works. 
Once they spin a silk cocoon, they will hibernate in that cocoon all winter long. And then they will emerge the following spring when temperatures reach about 55 degrees. So let's watch a little bit of video of little bees emerging from their cocoons. You can tell um, the males always emerge first. See that little white tuft of hair on its head or beard, if you want to call it. You can identify the emerging bees that are first coming out as males because they have that little white tuft of hair. There's another one you can see with a little white kind of mustache on its head or its mouth. Um, and you can identify them with their long antenna. So we love watching these little bees emerge. Um, this is my son holding a baby bee that's just hatched. He's just emerged from that cocoon. Um, and there's one just getting ready to fly off. So a lot of times people want to know what does a blue orchard mason bee look like? So we'll talk about the blue orchard bees because um, they're really popular in the Pacific Northwest. Um, my daughter used to call them a shimmery mermaid bee because of their green or blue iridescent sheen. They're really easy to spot in your yard because they bop along and they're really slow belly flopping bees. And um, they look like a housefly. They actually, you know, before I even knew what a mason bee was, I thought they were houseflies, but they're not. They are little tiny um, orchard bees that are incredible pollinators. So kids love mason bees because they're friendly and don't sting. They love to study them. Um, so we've rolled out a program to teach our kids about pollinators. It's really important to teach our youth. Um, we work with a lot of school teachers. A lot of teachers use our program to teach our kids about pollinators. They roll it into their science curriculum. So we've created um, on our learning portal on our website. So if you go to our learning portal and click youth programs, we have free printable workbooks and worksheets um, down below. Um, those links are videos to show kids, the best videos that I think are great that the kids love that you can show in a school environment. So they are incredible little pollinators. Kids can stand right up next to that bee block like that mom's showing her daughter in the picture. Um, they're, they won't bother you. They don't sting. They're super friendly. And it's a great way to teach our kids about our pollinators. So let's talk a little bit about the best practices for a successful habitat. If you want to raise solitary bees, what do you need to have a, and create a successful habitat? So the first thing that mason bees need is food. They are your early, early spring pollinators, which means when temperatures reach about 55 degrees, um, that's when things start to bloom. Um, and that's when they're gonna need that early spring bloom. So a lot of fruit trees bloom at that time. You'll have a lot of flowers in your garden. They're gonna need food right away because they've been hibernating all winter long and they're gonna be really hungry when they wake up. Um, the other thing you're gonna need is a really good shelter for them. Um, you're gonna need to set up a bee house that's gonna protect it from the rain. And you're gonna need to set it um, usually south facing. So that's facing the morning sun. Um, our bee houses are painted black to attract the sun and warm it up a little quicker. Um, and you're going to want to face that, like I said, south facing morning sun. Um, and then you're going to need a clay or mud source anywhere from 30 to 50 feet from their um, nesting block. Um, this is the mud that they're going to use to go into those chambers and make their mud mud cells with their babies. And then she's gonna use that mud to cap off the end. Um, so when she does that, you'll know there'll be about five to seven babies in there. Um, and then probably one of the most important things that we really try to teach everyone is to be pest pesticide free. As you can see with the mud, um, bee, uh, mason bees use that mud to, to lay right next to those tiny fragile larvae. So if you're using slug bait or weed killer or anything like that in your yard, you're actually doing more harm than good. Um, we are partners with the Pollinator Partnership. You can go visit their website, pollinator.org. They have some really great safe gardening tips. And we have some as well on our blog that I've written about uh, safe ways of removing slugs and earwigs and ants and all of that. Um, but the first food that you usually see for bees that a lot of people don't like are dandelions. That's actually one of the first spring blooms that we see 
which is really important for our uh, little spring pollinators. So when you look at a field of dandelions, you can either see a hundred weeds or a hundred wishes. If that's one thing that you can maybe keep in your yard, um, they are beautiful yellow. I know a lot of people don't like them, but they are a very important food for our early spring blooms um, and our early spring pollinators. So you can um, uh, pull them out by hand. Uh, we have other ideas and suggestions. I wrote a whole article about dandelions. They've actually been around for centuries, used as medicinal purposes. They're incredible um, for a lot of different reasons. Um, so if you're able to keep them, that would be great. Another important thing that we need to do is uh, harvest and clean your cocoons and nesting blocks every fall. Um, there are a lot of predators that get into the nesting blocks, just like if you have a honey beehive, you have to maintain that of parasites and predators. It's the same thing with a solitary bee block. Um, you can't just put out a nesting block and leave it. It has to be cleaned every year. Um, we get a lot of questions that, well, in nature, you don't have to clean it in nature, but in nature, those moms are going out and they're finding their own natural holes that are camouflaged by other things. When you put a nesting block out, you um, are doing a great thing for your mason bees because you're providing a nesting spot for her to lay her babies, but it's also a great source for the predators to just, just kind of hang out and know where, where to go. Um, so Houdini fly larvae are, Houdini fly are one of the predators to our little mason bees. They are a tiny little fly that looks like a fruit fly. I have all this on our blog if you want to see videos and what they look like. Um, but that little um, fruit fly looking bug will hang out outside of your nesting block. It'll wait for the mason bee to leave and then the Houdini fly will fly in and she will lay 15 to 20 tiny little eggs right next to the pollen loaf and the baby larva that the mason bee left for her baby. Um, that that who, those Houdini fly babies will now consume everything left for the mason bee and the mason bee won't survive and it will die. Um, and then those uh, larvae will stay in that nesting block until the following spring. And with the mason bee, it will emerge at the same time the following spring. Um, the same thing for pollen mites. Pollen mites are gathered when the bee goes out in the yard and she gets the little pollen mites that have been left by other um, pollinators on the flowers, they come back in and they multiply, they multiply so much. I have a slide that I'm going to show you next. So I hope I don't make you too squeamish, but pollen mites um, multiply quite significantly in that nesting chamber. Um, they um, eat all the pollen for the baby that um, the mom, mom mason bee left. And then as you can see in this picture here where the red arrow is, two cells up above that red arrow, you can see a full cocoon. It's muddy because it's been next to mud. But what happens is that mason bee is gonna crawl through that chamber of pollen mites to get out. And it's gonna get the pollen mites all over her body, which you can see in the picture in the top right corner. Those are microscopic pollen mites. All right, I'm gonna prep you. I'm gonna show you another slide that has, um, we work with research teams and labs all over the country um, who are studying how to care for our solitary bee populations. Um, this is University of California, Riverside. We are working with this um, research team. Uh, they, we sent them a vial of pollen mites for them to study. Um, they're trying to figure out um, the best ways of controlling the mortality by studying um, the mortality rate of our um, blue orchard bees by, by studying how these pollen mites are, are taking over when you don't clean and take care of those nesting blocks. So they look like little crab, they're tiny little mites, and um, it's definitely one of our major predators for our solitary bees. So it's really, really important if you're gonna host your own bees to harvest and clean them. Um, if it's something that you don't want to deal with, um, that's part of the rental program. We get asked rent bees. What does that mean? Well, you're not necessarily renting the bees. You're releasing bees into your environment and you're renting the nesting block. So you're going to send that nesting block back to us in September. And we are then going to do all the cleaning for you. That's part of the program is we do all the maintenance. 
So you can see by some of these little screen grabs, um, you can go to our YouTube channel and see the full video of our Mason bee fall harvest. It's pretty remarkable. We did 3 million bees last season, um, but we carefully remove them and extract them from the nesting block. Um, you'll, we'll have a whole, like in the handful there, you can see all the bee cocoons, the mud, the dirt. Well, we've got to give them a bath. So we give them a bath to remove all the mud, all the evasive predators. We rinse through them. And then we put them on a light board where we pick through the non-viable. You can tell, check out the video online. You can tell the non-viable bees because they are see-through, the cocoons. So um, we hand pick, hand pick through millions of bees. Um, to make sure that when we are sending uh, bees back to our gardening program and to our farmers, that they are all healthy, strong, viable, and predator-free. Um, then the final step that we do is once everything is extracted, we sterilize over fire all of our nesting blocks. There will be remaining chalk brood, there will be uh, pollen mites in that nesting block, so you have to harvest and clean. If you're doing this yourself, again, check out our harvest video. I take you step by step through the cleaning process and how to do it yourself. Um, so when uh, spring is done, like I mentioned earlier, those little mason bees are only going to fly four to six weeks. At the end of spring, it's really important to remove your mason bee nesting block. You do not want to leave it out over summer because that's when the new predators like mono wasps and birds will get to your bees. So you're going to very gently remove that mason bee nesting block and store it in a cool garage um, until you harvest it in September or if you're doing our rental program, you send it back to us and we do all the harvesting for you in September. Um, we harvest our bees in October. So um, we, re we get everything back in September and we do our harvest in October. That's when the bees are ready to be harvested when they've spun those silken cocoon. Um, if you are going to be renting leaf cutter bees and um, or putting out leaf cutter bees in your yard, that's when you swap the blocks. So when you're taking out that mason bee block to store in the garage over summer, if you're doing leaf cutter bees as well, leaf cutter bees are your summer pollinators, that's when you swap the block. So you take very gently that mason bee block out and then you put the leaf cutter bee block in. And then that leads us to talking about leaf cutter bees. So leaf cutter bees are tinier little bees. Your mason bees are kind of the slow bopping, kind of the clumsy little bee that bops along. Leaf cutter bees are very agile. They're quick, they're harder to spot in your yard. Um, they're about the size of your pinky fingernail if you have short nails. They're very, very tiny little bees and they are also very sweet little bees um, that, don't, that don't sting as well. Um, they are solitary, just like those mason bees. So they live alone, work alone. All the females lay all her own eggs and they are the summer pollinators. So they're gonna pollinate, they're, they're gonna emerge when temperatures reach about 75 degrees and they love the warmer climate. Um, so you'll see them emerge when temperatures are 75. So your vegetable gardens, those types of blooms is what the leaf cutter bee will pollinate. Um, they, again, are friendly, tiny little bees that won't sting. That's a little picture. They are really sweet little bees, but much smaller little bees. Um, so they are also belly floppers. They also collect pollen all over their bodies. You can see in this picture, she has pollen everywhere. And again, she's going to go enrich your environment as she pollinates. She's going to help you grow more vegetables. Um, and she's going to enrich everything she touches. Um, so these are three little leaf cutter bees that were emerging. Um, I just quickly grabbed them and put them on a really pretty flower so that I can show you what they look like. They're not going to be too active right now because they're still waking up, but you can see the size of them. They're really, really small little bees. So the leaf cutter bees use tiny, tiny little pieces of leaves. So you can't really tell with the pictures in the video how small they are, but they are super tiny. And they do cut out little arch, little half circles in your leaves or in your flowers to use for their nesting material. Um, so um, they don't damage the plants when they do this or the leaves, um, but they do use those little leaves to, to make their nest. Um, this little bee, you can see it kind of hovering with the tiny little leaf piece. 
what she's going to do is she's going to crawl into that hole. She's going to go in that hole and she's going to take that leaf and she's going to chew it up. She's going to make it really pliable for um, um, spreading it out in that little hole. So she'll chew it up. She'll press it along the sides of the hole and then she'll go back and she'll get a couple more and she'll do that. Then she'll lay a pollen loaf and a little, little teeny tiny larva and then she'll get another leaf and she'll seal it up and make a, a small leaf sleeping bag. I like to call them leaf sleeping bags because when you look at them, they're very small. You can see on the right and left of this video, um, little cells of leaf cutter bees. Um, we love when we do the harvest, we find some pretty remarkable um, I love it. I think they're little artists. Their artwork is their little leaf chambers are beautiful. So the top purple and white one, obviously those are flower petals that that little leaf cutter bee used. The middle one is green leaves and then there are some purple flowers that this little leaf. So each one of these cells, um, kind of like fish scales, if you run your finger down, it'll pull apart. But inside each one of those is a little tiny larva and they will hibernate in the larvae state over winter. They don't make, they're not a full grown bee until temperatures reach 55, they wake up, eat the pollen. So they hibernate over winter in the larvae state. Mason bees hibernate over winter in a cocoon as a full grown bee. So leaf cutter bees live for six to eight weeks and they lay about 20 eggs in their lifetime. They are known as the world's primary pollinator for alfalfa. Um, alfalfa plants have a tiny little purple flower with a pistil that triggers when the big pollinators land on it. But alfalfa um, uh, leafcutter bees aren't bothered by that. So they're able to pollinate um, 15 times more uh, of the food. So the food that our livestock eat, cows and pigs, um, it, they are a huge resource for our farmers um, when we are using leaf cutter bees in our crops. Um, we also do the leaf cutter harvest. Um, if you are renting from our program uh, and you're stored away that mason bee block and you've got your leaf cutter bee block, you're going to send and mail back both those nesting blocks back to us in September. Um, check out our YouTube channel. We, did, we have a whole video on our leaf cutter bee harvest if you're curious to see that. But um, this is Nina. She's holding um, a whole bunch of our leaf cutter bees that we just harvested. And we harvest those by hand. They're very fragile in that leaf state. So we do all our leaf cutter bee harvest by hand. So how can you help? How can you be a successful solitary bee host? So again, I'll always talk about this. It's really important to be a pollinator friendly yard, with no chemicals or pesticides. Um, and it's not just our solitary bees that you have to worry about. We have lots of pollinators that are impacted by pesticides. Besides the bees, there's the beautiful butterflies and moths and beetles and hummingbirds. And we even have bats that'll go um, and pollinate um, all of your food and fruit and all of our trees. So it's really important to protect all our pollinators and please try not to spray weed killers or pesticides. Again, you can visit pollinator.org. They have a lot of great tips about um, safe gardening practices, or you can visit our blog where I've posted a lot of um, safe gardening tips for, um, for your pollinators. Um, the other important thing, and this is a big thing, if you know people that are using this, it's kind of an old school way where people would take a big log and they would drill holes in it. That is the worst type of nesting material you can use. You're actually over time gonna be creating a nest for predators. As you saw in the earlier slides with the Houdini fly and the pollen mites, if you're not able to open up that nesting block and clean it every fall, you're doing more harm than good. Um, so there are ways we can teach you about um, eliminating those types of nesting materials if you have them in your yard. Um, if you have those wood blocks with holes built, uh, drilled in it, simply just tip it with the holes upright sprinkle sawdust all over the tops of those holes. The mason bees will emerge, the sawdust will fill the holes, and then those mason bees won't go back in there and nest. Then you can 
burn your block. It's probably full of predators if you've never cleaned it and you just leave it out year round. Um, over time, your, sol your solitary bee population will decline and eventually the, the predators will take over and um, they're gonna do more harm than good for your population. The other type of nesting material that is not good to use are bamboo reeds. Those are, um, you also cannot open those and they, um, they uh, harbor fungus and they get damp and they get moldy and they get wet and they're just not healthy for your solitary bee population. So if you want to raise your own, which we have a lot of people that do and we love it when they do, you have to use the proper nesting material. So the proper nesting material are stacking trays that you can pull apart and harvest and clean. That picture there is one of the trays that we use. We have a big machine that harvests all of our um, bees since we did 3 million bees. But if you do them yourself, stacking trays or cardboard tubes. Tubes that you can pull out, unravel. You'll have to re reuse them. You have to get new ones every year if you use the cardboard tubes. If you use the stacking trees, just trays, just make sure you're sterilizing those with fire so that you're cleaning all the predators off of them. So again, harvest and clean every fall is a key critical step to hosting and being a successful host to solitary bees. Um, again, check out our YouTube channel. I have a whole harvest video on there that you can reference. I'll put links down below this video so that you can have easy access to everything that we talk about. Um, so if you wanted to host bees, um, either yourself or with our program, our program makes it really, really easy. You're just going to hang that black house in a sunny south facing spot, place your nesting block, you're going to get that white tube that's going to be full of about 60 mason bee cocoons. And you're going to take that tape off and stick it at the top and you're done. The bees will fly out of that hole, they'll emerge and they'll pollinate and enrich your yard. So um, it is time now to get your mason bees. Um, I'm doing this video in February. Um, we're gonna start shipping bees to our warmer states this month and then March and April to all of our other states that um, want to get mason bees with us. Um, again, they're incredible pollinators. They're gentle and stingless bees. We do all the maintenance for you. So that's how our program works. You release bees, you send the nesting blocks back to us. We do all the cleaning for you in the fall. So it is time. Our little bees are getting ready to emerge from their cocoons. If you're interested in ordering a starter kit, it comes with everything you need to be a successful host, including the maintenance where we harvest and clean everything for you. Um, if you've never heard of a solitary bee, if that's why you're watching this video, you're going to start hearing more and more about them. Um, Mother Earth News did a feature story, cover story on solitary bees. It's a great article. It is the February issue if you want to pick it up. Um, we'll also have links to the article um, down below in the video, but I love the quote they, they put in there. When solitary bees show up, success literally blooms all around. And it's, it's so true. These little bees are going to enrich your habitat. You're going to help their population by releasing them in the environment. And they are just incredible pollinators and super sweet little bees. So I just want to thank you for your time. Um, this is a little bee. I got this on my macro lens last year. You see the little, three little dots on the top of its head. Those are eyes. They're remarkable and you can see its little face has pollen. Um, this little bee was just resting. It was busy working. As you know, they're hard workers. Um, so if you have any questions, you're always welcome to email us at info at rentmasonbees.com. Uh, please follow our Facebook page if you're a Facebook person or Instagram. We put a lot of things on there. Um, follow our newsletter. Um, we send out tips and tricks on how to be a Mason Bee host in our newsletter. And yeah, if you ever have, um, if you ever need anything or have questions, just give us a call. Um, I hope that this video um, helped you and taught you something new. And um, yeah, enjoy and a happy pollinating everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.